welcome to the International Symposium. My name is Nick Journey. I'm with the Office of International Programs. Today's session is Greenness and Democracy. It's presented by Edward Barbier. He is a university distinguished professor in economics here at CSU. Before we get started, um, do want to point out the QR code um, posted here. If you would be so kind as to scan it um, after the session, provide feedback. Online participants, there will be a link for feedback um, popping up on your screens following the session. And with that, welcome again, and I'll turn it over. Thanks, Nick. I really appreciate it. Um, so when this symposium came together, I said to the organizers, I'd, I'd love to do a session on this topic. And what I proposed was to start by doing some of my research in this area, uh, which I hope you guys will find interesting. And then hopefully have some discussion. So if you plan to come here and just sort of sit quietly and, you know, uh, contemplate the view, listen to the drumming, you know, uh, that's fine for a little while. You can do that while I'm talking, but then I'm going to hopefully get you guys to uh, contribute. So this is uh, uh, not a panel session. This is a uh, session where I'll talk for a bit and then hopefully everybody can chip in with all their thoughts, because this, I believe, is a topic that matters to everybody. Um, and regardless of, of whether you are an academic or or not, or whether, you, what if you are an academic, wherever you do your work uh, in, in academics, uh, sciences, social sciences, literature even, uh, and in my case, economics. So I am an economist, and as a result, I'm going to give an economic flavor to this talk, but I see this as an interdisciplinary exercise. Um, just a little footnote, when I was an undergraduate, uh, my degrees were both economics and political science, so I've always had a very, very important uh, interest in the intersection of those two disciplines. And I, from time to time, have worked a lot with political scientists, and I also very much respect their work uh, uh, particularly when it comes to um, issues of democracy, which are so central to our society in this symposium, of course. And then the final thing I'll say is um, I'm also a senior scholar in the School of Global Environmental uh, uh, Studies, and um, I, I have a very uh, a deep appreciation of SOGES here at CSU, and I also uh, owe my being here to the late Diana Wall, who has been, who was the founder of SOGES and was a great leader up until her retirement death recently. So this is dedicated to her, my talk. Okay, so I just want to go through some background. And um, I first want to point out that, you know, climate change and democracy are probably the two big global issues that are under crisis right now. We hear about this all the time in the media. And a whole bunch of, uh, of people, scholars, and even uh, commentators in, in, in popular media and, and ordinary people, uh, and ordinary citizens have argued that these two are complementary. These two crises are not mutually exclusive. They're not at war with each other, but they are complementary. There's connections between the two. So in particular, reducing Reliances on fossil fuels and transitioning to a low carbon or a green economy could make uh, democratic societies more sustainable. And then equally, it's been argued that um, democracies, uh, their biggest uh, uh, characteristic or most important characteristic is, of course, freedom, but it's also voice and accountability, giving voice to citizens and accountability of leaders. And more voice and accountability will mean that those growing share of people who care about having a greener economy um, get more attention. And, and so hence, I think there's a connection and a lot of other people do as well. And that leads to the question that I've been trying to address in my recent research, which I wanna share with you as a way of getting into this session, which um, do more democratic countries tend to adopt greener economic policies. Um, now, in thinking about uh, this question, one has to realize that this 
uh, phenomenon of becoming greener is really quite recent. We're talking about the last three decades, really, from 1995 to the present. And to give you a flavor for that timeline, um, I'm actually going to just point out a few pivotal events that occurred during this period. And um, I also recognize that this, this is my subjective view of these. Uh, uh, there are other events that many of you, I'm sure, could point to. Uh, um, this is not comprehensive, but it gives you a flavor that this has been an important three decades when it comes to um, uh, green transition uh, 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 efforts. And probably the first one, and again, my apologies, um, if, if those in the back room have trouble seeing this, I'll try and explain what's going on in the slide. Uh, 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 but um, it, it, if we look at the past three decades, I think one of the most pivotal events was the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, which was the first climate treaty, although not much was decided there, it was all voluntary and all that. It nonetheless set the precedent that we're going to talk about um, uh, uh, reducing carbon emissions, becoming greener in our economies. And then not much happened. I mean, some things happened, but I think then a very interesting ha thing happened. On the one hand, we had a very terrible uh, period of recession, which is called the Great Recession, which is the greatest global downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. But what was very interesting about this Great Recession is that some of the spending that occurred what we, um, was actually green. Uh, in the response to the Great Recession, economies, uh, many economies around the world said we have to ramp up government spending, and many of them attempted to put in what they call green stimulus, which are stim uh, investments that uh, particularly uh, favor uh, low carbon technologies or products, um, and also some investments uh, to reduce pollution uh, and, and so forth. And I don't know if you can see it back there, but I'll explain that, that I, I um, did several studies during this period trying to figure out how much was spent as did other people. And the general conclusion is that during this Great Recession period, about $520 billion was spent globally on what we can call green stimulus. So not only to stimulate the economy and generate short-term jobs, but actually to try to do something about environmental hazards, particularly moving towards more low-carbon, clean energy investments. Um, and then, um, during this period, I was I was asked by the United Nations to draft something which later became their green global green new deal. And um, essentially, uh, this report, which I eventually turned into a book, was arguing stimulus is fine to get your uh, economy jump started and on a trajectory uh, that that may be greener and maybe start reducing emissions. But if we want to do something that is more lasting and more structurally different in our economies to move it to a low carbon transition, we got to have a sustained series of policies and investments over several years. And that was the basis of the Global Green New Deal. And, uh, and we outlined um, in this report uh, the short term things we needed to do, the things that richer countries had to do and what low and low income countries could or should not do. Um, and um, uh, meanwhile, uh, soon after uh, this period of the Great Recession, once we started to recover our economies, then another remarkable thing happened. Just when we all thought that global climate negotiations were dead in the water, along comes the 2015 Paris Accord. Now, in this case, we actually had actual targets that countries and pledges the countries made to actually reduce their carbon emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions over the coming year. Now, these are voluntary, but countries started to actually respond by doing some policies. Um, it was open to each country to decide how they would meet their pledges, and some of them started to do that. Um, and right after that, we started to see other things happening. In 2018, out of nowhere, uh, a, 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 the youngest congresswoman or, and the youngest congressperson in the United States, uh, um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, said that the U.S. needs a Green New Deal. And so she launched a Green New Deal and it became world famous. 
And um, although it didn't uh, materialize for this country, it was influential in the next year for the Europeans to come up with their own Green New Deal. And then of course, so shortly after that, we had the famous uh, COVID-19 pandemic from which we're still recovering. But once again, a remarkable thing happened during this period, 2021, which is similar to what happened during the Great Recession. We had a huge, uh, of course, uh, downturn in the world economy again, but as part of their recovery policies, a large number of countries said, well, we need to green, have to include some green investments again, particularly boosts to clean energy. And, and this time, just under $900 billion uh, during the 2021 COVID period, uh, recovery period, about, uh, just under $900 billion went to green recovery initiatives. Uh, uh, not the entire recovery was a, this is just the green recovery. And then soon after, in this country, 2022, the Biden administration came in and added um, $369 billion of green spending as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. And so you know, what you can see from this is that there's clearly been a lot of activity in the last three decades, but it's accelerated especially um, in, uh, in, uh, in recent years to uh, to try and green our economies. Um, and so that's the timeline, in, which I think is incredibly important to think about the connection between greenness and democracy. How successful has this been? Well, if you look at global emissions of, of uh, greenhouse gases, they keep rising. But as we'll see in a minute, that's not necessarily true when we think about what's happening in individual countries and certainly not true when we talk about the greenhouse gas or the carbon uh, dioxide intensity of economies. There has been progress there. Um, but, um, but although it may appear as though all these developments may not have slowed significantly the, the global trend in total carbon and greenhouse gas emissions, there has been an impact. And it's varied from country to country. And that gets back to the question, to what extent are more democratic countries having an impact compared to less democratic countries? And why is that important? Well, because during this period, we've seen a remarkable change in democracy. Um, Freedom House is one of the many organizations that tracks uh, the state of, the, of democracy in the world. Uh, and if you watch their trends, and you've been following them, in the early part of this period, there was improvement in freedom and democracy in the world till about 2005. And since then, we've been on a steady decline. And in fact, if you looked at Freedom House, I'm sorry, Freedom House's latest report, the 2024 report that was released about a month or so ago, in 2023, global freedom declined for the 18th consecutive year. So hence this red line. So what we're seeing is a decline in democracy globally, we're seeing more green efforts happening, and we're having some impacts on greenhouse gases, maybe not total emissions. So that question is really relevant. Is there a connection here? For those countries that have stayed democratic, have they become greener? For those that have become less democratic or have always been less democratic, are they not becoming green? Um, so you're probably wanting to know, how do you measure greenness? Uh, that's that's an important. Another question we're going to come back to is how do we measure democracy? And that's that's an interesting one as well. But let's talk about greenness first. One way we can approach greenness is by policy adoption. Are we are countries adopting greener policies or not? And the two variables that I'm familiar with, and I think uh, over this period are very relevant, is uh, is first of all. The first variable is, is, of course, what I already mentioned in that timeline, is that we're, there were two distinct periods of time during the Great, Depre uh, Great Recession of 2008-9 and during the recent global recovery period 20 to 21 from the pandemic. In these two periods, there was a significant bump up of green spending by, by countries. And the variable that is interesting here is um, countries that had uh, spent uh, at least some share uh, or maybe zero of their 
uh, 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 oh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Of all the countries that have uh, that we have information on that they did some stimulus or recovery spending in these two periods, what is the percentage of that spending that's been green? Some it's zero, some it's actually quite a lot. And it turns out that myself, uh, as a uh, track, the, I have the information for 79 countries, 2008, nine, and most recently the Global Recovery uh, Observatory in Oxford has tracked it for the same 79 countries. So we have 79 countries that have spent recovery spending during this period, these two periods, and um, they uh, uh, some of them have spent nothing on green, and some have spent a lot, and some have done it one period but not the other. And the key thing is that this is a really diverse group of countries too. 36 are high income, but 43 are emerging market and developing economies, which are in other. Uh, like the World Bank would call these low and middle income countries. So 36 are high income, 43 are emerging market developing economies or um, uh, um, low and middle income countries. Um, now, the other thing that's happened is you remember I bracketed uh, that time period by the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, and then of course uh, the Paris Agreement 2015, and then, and then the aftermath uh, has been the last uh, 10 years, uh, governments have pursued those pledges by different policies. Well, there's a lot of data that shows how many climate actions or new legislation has been adopted. But there's a really interesting data set from the Organization, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, which for 49 countries not only tracks how many policies were adopted, but how stringent they are. Do they actually do the job? Or are they just on paper, or these days on the website? Uh, and again, for these 49 countries, it's a little different. We have countries, these are mainly uh, high income countries, 37 of them, but there are 12 mainly new income countries. So here are two indicators of greenness that we could use, and which I do use. Um, and let me show you the trends for these things. So now what I've done is I've done, um, is that uh, I, I have averaged these, well, oh, let me, I'm sorry, let me, let me start with this one. So let me start with the first one, which is green stimulus and recovery spending share of total spending in these two periods. This is the period 28 to 29, I stop it at 2010, 2020, 21, I call it 2020. And what you can see is clearly it was much higher uh, in the recent period compared to the other on average. And the green line shows um, the dispersal of across the 79 countries. It's a large variation, right? Some are close to zero, if not zero, and others have spent quite a lot. And then the mean has gone up in the two periods. But nonetheless, it's not insignificant. Equally, we can track the stringency of policies. And here what I've done is the data are averaged over five year periods. So what I mean is that if you take 2005, that's the average of, uh, of the rating of stringency from 2001 to 2005. So the, the year is, is, the, is the, the last year of the five year average, if you like. So that, that is necessary for my statistical analysis. And, uh, and so what you can see here is that as you would expect, um, uh, the, the red line is the average across all the 49 countries. You can see that on average, stringency has gone up in these 49 countries. And um, you can see by, because almost all of them have some kind of stringency and there are some that are very stringent. Again, the variation is there. Uh, uh, so that's a sign that we have seen some economies, at least among these 49, that have adopted more stringent policy but there's huge variation. And we want to know how much does democracy matter to this variation. Okay, we can also measure greenness by economic impact. So there's policies, but those policies may be diddly squat, right? They may not have any impact. So we also wanna say, well, okay, do we have a measure of what's the impact been on economies? And one indicator, which is, um, uh, 
it has both pros and cons to it. The pro is it's very easy to measure. The con is, is that it may not be capture the entire change uh, towards a more green economy. Uh, and that indicator is green export share. That's the share of green products and services as percentage of total exports of goods and services of the country. And um, here, uh, the, the Green Transition Navigator at Oxford actually has collected this uh, statistics for almost the entire world, 172 countries, from this entire period, 95 to 2020. And this group of 172 countries reflects the distribution of countries in the world pretty much, because it's nearly all the major countries in the world. It's 52 high-income countries and 120 emerging market and developing economies. Um, now, another interesting statistic of an indicator of more greenness can come from uh, the electricity generation sector. And again, for these same 172 countries, uh, thanks to uh, uh, a, a, a industry source that tracks global electricity, um, you can find how much wind and solar is a share of total electricity generation, again, over this entire period. So I have two indicators of economic impact, very different, and what, and also for the same group of countries, the, the 52 high income, 120 EMBEs. So what does this look like over the same period? So again, these are averaged over the every five years, and this is the five-year average. Uh, 2000 is from 96 to 2000. And 2005, 2001, 2005 average. And you can see that with, with green export share, interestingly, the average hasn't gone much up. So you can't see the, there should be a red dot here, but it's sort of covered by the green. And the, the red dot represents the average across the entire sample of 172 countries. But the, the blue uh, here is actually telling you where the green the red dot is, even if you can't exactly see it. So basically, you can see from the blue year labels here that the average hasn't gone much up. What, what you see is that some countries have gotten greener. You can see the variation has gone up a little bit there. I mean, there's more, slightly more spread. So that's an indicator that hasn't changed that much, but there is some variation from country to country. Um, winds and solar share of electricity generation, however, has really gone up over the same period both an average and you can see the dispersion. So I have two indicators here that, uh, of economic impact that behave very differently. Does democracy affect them? Well, let's see. Then finally, the variable that everybody cares about, or at least they say they care about, which is uh, carbon dioxide emissions, the main greenhouse gas. We can use that as our measure of greenness. Now, of course, a country is getting greener if its CO2 impact gets lower, right? And there's two ways we measure CO2 impact. One way is CO2 emissions per capita, okay? And again, these same 172 countries, and the, the, the data we have best is from the main source of CO2 emissions across countries, which is from fossil fuels and cement. So, uh, um, again, from the same period. And then the other one is like uh, what we call in economics, carbon dioxide intensity um, of an economy. And all that means is how much, uh, how much CO2 do you emit to produce a dollar of your GDP? So for every economic value, economic good and service, a dollar of economic good and service you produce, how much emissions do you generate to, get to, to produce that dollar of GDP. And so, um, so it's the same emissions divided per unit of GDP, which is a dollar. And again, it's for the same 172 and over the same period. And what we see here is, of course, something very, very, those of you who follow CO2 trends will know very well that uh, average CO2 per capita hasn't changed very much over this period, despite all our efforts. Uh, but what you can see is there's huge variation and disparity. Um, the intensity index, so what we want is this to go down, right? Because it's a bad 
And what we want is CO2 intensity to go down. We, we want to pr produce less greenhouse gas emissions per unit of GDP. And you can see that happens much better for the CO intensity of our economy. So for our economies, emissions per capita haven't changed that much, but they have for certain economies. And CO2 emissions uh, uh, per unit of GDP, CO2 intensity has declined somewhat on average, and it's also falling and we're getting lower and lower uh, levels, even by the high emitters. So that suggests that we have, to, again, two indicators that are very different. And so the question is, has democracy had an impact? Well, before I get to that, I want to talk about measures of democracy. Now, those of you who are political scientists will say that's a no-brainer. Uh, now, political scientists generally use a data set called Varieties of Democracy, which is a long-term data set for almost every country in the world, showing the level of democracy. And the measure that, that comes from this data set that people use in the most is, 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 is it, it, as their measure of po polyarchy, which is another word of, for rule by the many, um, uh, is what they, they call the Electoral Democracy Index, or which I'll call EDI. And that's scaled on zero to one. And it tells us to what extent are political leaders elected under comprehensive suffrage and free and fair elections and freedoms of association and expression are guaranteed. Um, and so that's collected for all the countries in the world. But there's two other indicators that are worth considering as well. One is a, a, an indicator which for some reason economists have latched onto, partly because it was available before the VDEM that, um, uh, um, data set, and partly because economists have just, we're, we're kind of conservative, so we, we find something, we kind of stick with it. And so we stuck with this index, Polity 2, which comes from the Polity Project, but it does pretty much the same thing as the EDI index. And then finally, what's interesting is that the VDEM project, when they write their reports on the state of democracy, they use a completely different index. They don't always use the EDI, they use a liberal democracy index. And so that's another index that you could use. Um, and, and in fact, when I do my analysis, I use all three just to see what the different effects are. Um, now, this is a little bit more tricky, but I think I hopefully I can explain the logic of it. Um, the problem is that we don't want to use current levels of democracy, particularly over this last three year, sorry, three decade period because they've been fluctuating so much. And so a country could be democratic in 2010 and end up being less, much less democratic in 2020. Does that sound familiar? Do you know which country I'm talking about? It could be even less democratic after 2024, depending on the outcome. Yeah, we know. But there are other countries where you've had complete flip-flops during this period. So if you go back to the period of 1995 to 2020, Russia, was highly democratic based on any current measure of democracy at the time. After 2005, when a certain gentleman from the KGB, ex-KGB guy became president, democracy in Russia has plummeted. In 1995 to 2000, Ukraine was considered an autocratic country. Indeed it was. And then, since then, we've seen a difference. And in the last 10 years, uh, and certainly the current period, it's considered democratic by most, or more democratic. So there's been significant change in the current level of democracy, as well as that overall decline. So most economic studies and, eco and political studies are, are, are say we should maybe look at a long-term legacy of democracy if we're gonna look at the impact on policies and outcomes like uh, green, becoming greener. And that's for two reasons. One is it takes a long time for policies to be put together and for policies to reach fruition. And it takes an even longer time for the policies to be sustained and to lead to an economic or environmental outcome that is causing either a fall in emissions or um, a structural change in the economy. So it's the long run experience with electoral democracy that seems to matter. So I borrow from uh, uh, economists who study political economy for a while, uh, these people called Person and Tablini, and I basically um, say that democratic experience is what matters here. 
not just the current level of democracy, and it's based on past levels of democracy, electoral democracy in a country, and also, although that's true, you want your past level of democracies to matter, clearly it's the democracy experience that is closer to the present that matters more than that in the past. So I follow their lead and I come up with a variable called cumulative democratic experience, which means that regardless of which indicator I use, EDI or LDI from, from the variables of democracy index or polity two from the polity banks, I do the same thing. I sum the cumulative democratic experience over a long period of time, which is 40 years in the, from 40 years ago to today. And I discount what we call in economics, I discount it. So things way in the past count less for the, the experience today as opposed to things five years ago. And for those who, those who are palsy wonks, the discount rate I use is 0 0.94, which is what, what these guys use. So I'm not doing anything fancy here. I'm just taking into account this idea that when it comes to policies and long-term structural change, green transition, it's clearly going to be, I think, cumulative democratic experience that matters. Okay, so now the big question is, looking at the, some of these outcome variables that I suggested, how does cumulative democratic experience affect them? Um, I hope you can see this in the back. It's not a call. But, so if, if you recall, I had six possible variables. I'm going to show you four of them, but I can guarantee you it's the same for the other two that I haven't shown. You. And what you see, these are the, the blue dots of the data points and the red uh, dashed line. That's the fitted value. That's the estimated value. Now, this is not, uh, this is a correlation. And this is just throwing all the variables in. It's not actually a careful uh, statistical analysis. I do that later. But I just wanted to see whether I could see any kind of significant relationship between Q to democratic experience, which is on this line, measured um, the way I just described it, and some indicator of greenness. So this first one up here is uh, the green policies, those two periods of green policies, 2008-9, and then the COVID recovery. And you can see that as cumulative democratic experience increases, you see that on the whole, there is an increase in uh, greenness uh, or reduction of those, uh, of a greater share of green uh, policies in total spending or green spending in total spending, I should say. Um, then I do the same thing with the stringent, uh, the measure of stringency climate action policies and policies done by, um, uh, uh, for those 49 countries over the entire period. And what you see again, very strong relationship between cumulative democratic experience and um, these uh, um, uh, more stringent policies for climate action. And then our two, I'm gonna use one outcome variable, which is the green export share. Again, a little bit more noisy, but you still have a positive relationship more cumulative democratic experience, the countries experience more cumulative democratic experience over uh, 95 to 2020, generally had higher green export share. Here is um, for one of the CO2 variables, this is for carbon dioxide intensity, again, cumulative democratic experience, and we have a decline in CO2 intensity. So the more democratic countries were over this period, generally you were associated with a decline in CO2 intensity, which is what is a good thing. Uh, okay, so this, yeah, Rick. So every blue dot here is a country. A country, an observation in one of those five yeah. year, from 95. So yeah. is there any value in trying to weight the country by its size? Uh, I'll one, come back to that. One blue dot for the. This for is just purely China. Another blue is, dot for. This uh, is purely. Or something. No, you're absolutely right, Rick. I really appreciate that comment. This is just simply to see if there's a correlation between the, the, the two variables of interest, which is some measure of greenness and some measure of cumulative democratic experience. Um, this is uh, this is purely a pre-analysis to see if there is any relationship, or if the dots are just randomly there to actually. To see if that relationship holds, I want to test something more. And I need to test something that's very important here. 
because one of the concerns is that, well, okay, all you're doing is looking at two variables and looking at the association between them over this period. But we also know that a lot of countries that are high income countries also become green. And in fact, you can see that as if you group countries um, by income group, in each of these cases, you see the same thing. You see also see from low income to lower middle income to upper middle income and high income in each of these things, countries that move that are in these groups each adopt more greenness. So income also matters. So that so other things may also matter in the economy. But the two that seem to matter the most to explain greenness over this period, you come to democratic experience, income may matter too. How do they matter? Well, let's start with this. Let's just say that maybe what's happening here, and there's some evidence from other papers to suggest this, is that maybe it's the income per capita of a country that matters in explaining any impact of democratic experience on greenness. In other words, if you're a poor country, maybe you know greenness is less of an option, regardless of whether you're democratic or not, because you're a poor country. You, you know, adopting policies to become greener may not matter. Or you could also argue that high-income countries also um, um, tend to allow more democracy and that will allow more greenness. But the other way you can think about it is that if a democratic government is anti-green, then it's not likely to, to implement green transition policies. But if the share of the population supporting green policies is increasing, the government may have to either reverse this decision or face the risk of losing re-election. And as a country's level per capita income increases, it's possible that a larger share of the population will favor policies to become greener. In other words, as an economy gets richer, maybe people now start to turn their attention away from basic needs, you know, poverty, and uh, you know, uh, uh, and and uh, so forth, to be concerned about the environment and be concerned about the state of their economy. And if they're also democratic, then maybe that means a larger share of the population will not only be interested in becoming green, but they'll have a voice to do it because of its democracy, a, a democracy. So that leads to my hypothesis that I want to test, is that the impact of electoral, uh, electoral democracy or electoral democratic experience on green policies and structural transformation is conditioned on the per capita income of an economy. which means that if you're too poor, being democratic or not may not have much of an influence on your adoption of green policies. But as you get become richer, it might. That's what I want to test. And that's why I end up testing. I'm going to skip a lot of the, the stuff to just show you the results of this. Uh, so I, I, I take the 172 countries for much of the stuff. And the main result is that regardless of which indicator I use, whether I start with those 172 countries and look at green export share, wind, solar uh, share, electricity generation, or those two CO2 variables, cumulative, and, and regardless of which measure of cumulative democratic experience I use based on um, the electoral democracy index or based on polity two or the liberal democracy index, I always get the same result. This, I can't reject this hypothesis. And um, when I also boil it down to just those policy choices, right? Either the clean action policies for just a subset of 79, uh, sorry, 49 countries, or whether I look at just the 79 countries that uh, may or may not have adopted green spending in the two periods I talked about, the Great Recession and the COVID recovery, the same thing happens. So um, I get this, I can't reject this hypothesis no matter what. So clearly the implications is that the level of per capita income of a country matters for whether democracy promotes greener policies and 
structural change. In other words, as countries become richer, democracy or experience with democracy exerts a more positive impact on greenness. And in fact, for the poorest countries, countries at the lowest level, that even if they're democratic, it may actually have a negative impact on greenness. But this negative impact lessens as the countries become richer. And for any country above a threshold level of GDP per capita, which I call white star, democracy actually exerts a positive influence on greenness, no matter what measure of greenness I use, or the ones I have. And this positive impact increases with the higher the level of per capita income of the country. Now, getting back to Rick's point, one of the important things is to see, well, you know, I've got uh, obviously a measure of greenness, which I'm trying to explain, and I've got two variables that may explain it, income per capita, um, cumulative democratic <laughs> experience, and their interaction. Um, but there may be other things that determine greenness, such as whether country is open, open to trade or not, whether it a, a, has a relatively large account, uh, share of its population that's urban, whether population growth, all these what we call control variables, I also include. And I get this result regardless of whether I completely leave out all those control variables or whether I, I leave them in. And that's what I want to show you is what I get. So this is for um, the two policy periods I've talked about, the period of um, the, uh, the share of green policy investments, total spend stimulus in either the 2008-9 period or the recent COVID period of 2020-21. And the, the blue line is that effect I showed you, the impact of cumulative democratic spirits on the green share in that spending in those two periods, but it's conditioned on the level of GDP per capita. So this is the effect of democratic experience on becoming more green, but it's conditioned by GDP per capita. So this is in logarithm. So as GDP per capita is growing, you can see that you have more and more positive impact on coming greenness if you're more democratic. But the key thing is the threshold level GDP per capita. So if, for a country that is greater than Y star, then cumulative democratic experience starts to have a positive impact on becoming greener. And, and for this case, I, I, I don't know if you can see it, but um, the, the threshold level, which is zero here, it occurs at a GDP capita with controls of $8,256. So for any country that is at that level of GDP per capita over, uh, and I use that the, in 2020, or richer, they're gonna have if they become more democratic, those that are more democratic are going to have uh, adopted a greater share of um, green spending during these two periods. And just to put into context, this level of GDP per capita, that's equivalent to, to, to the country Bolivia. So what that means is that for countries that are, were richer than Bolivia in 2020, those that were greener, Sorry, those that were more democratic in terms of more democratic experience tended to adopt more green spending in these two periods. So I find the same thing. Oh, question. Yeah, can I ask, and I think I, I missed this, but where does consumption play into this? Because I just think as people have more income, we have a tendency to spend more money, buy more things, produce more sure. waste. I just, I, and I didn't know if that factored into the uh, well, I mean, green the green uh, data point you put together or? Um, it, well, I mean, if, it, if it's, uh, uh, if, it, if you're concerned about the, you can measure greenness by the products that you produce and you can measure by what you consume. I don't have indicator of consumption of green products by country, okay? I do have a measure of green exports by product uh, relative to total exports. If I had a measure of over this entire period, not just you know a single year, if I did have a measure of the share of cons total consumption that's green consumption, yes, I'd use that as another indicator, but I don't have that. Okay, so um, 
Now, what about the stringency of climate action and policies? Now, this is the case where I do, for 49 countries, have it for the entire period. And what I find is the same thing, is that on the whole, um, that uh, as countries become richer, then there's more impact on becoming democratic, of being more democratic on developing, uh, sorry, adopting more stringent climate actions and policies. Here, the turning point where this becomes uh, a positive impact is a G level GDP per capita of $17,222. That's equivalent in 2020 to the average income per capita of the Dominican Republic. And Dominican Republic is an upper middle Asian country. So for other countries that are as least as rich as Dominican Republic or richer, then more democratic versions of those countries become, uh, have, had, have, had adopted more stringent climate action and policies than less democratic. Um, then the other thing is this green export share. Uh, uh, and again, uh, same thing, uh, same result, not much difference between with controls or without controls. Now the threshold GDP is a little bit lower. It's about $9,941. And that's equivalent to the GDP per capita of Namibia, which is a, a, a country, uh, a lower middle income country in southwestern uh, Africa. So again, much more countries are, have GDP per capita that's higher than Namibia's. And for those countries, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, more democratic versions of those countries uh, uh, generally have higher green export share. Okay, now, this is the version for the carbon intensity of economies. And here, what we're seeing is the same thing. And in fact, um, in this, but of course, it declines. As countries become more democratic, they're clearly uh, are um, reducing their, their greenhouse gas and, or the carbon intensity of their, their economies. And what we find is that the threshold where this starts to happen is $5,750 per capita. And that's pretty low. Well. That's equivalent of Nicaragua, Central America. So a lot of countries fall in the category where they have enough levels of income per capita where becoming more democratic has led to them becoming less carbon intensive in their economies. Okay, so like I said, this, this holds for all sorts of things. Oh, this is uh, per capita. And this one is interesting because remember I showed you that CO2 per capita really isn't coming down for on average across most of the world and it hasn't really changed that much. This backs it up is that the threshold level is really high. It's 28,659 and that's equivalent to Panama. So except for many high income countries, again, for most countries, you're not going to see democratic experience impacting CO2 per capita, but certainly for high income countries, it matters. Okay, there's policy implications for all this. The first is that regardless of the indicator, whatever, certainly among, if you just looked at the high income countries, it's clear the democratic experience does matter. Most of the high income countries of the world are well beyond that threshold. So the more democratic ones clearly are having some impact them becoming green, regardless of whether you use a policy measure, uh, a measure, some measure of the greenness of economy, although I would like, as the gentleman says, to have, you know, green, greenness share of consumption, but I don't. And also CO2 impact. Clearly, for high-income countries, it matters if you are uh, more democratic or not in terms of whether you're, you're becoming greener in this period. And, um, but... There are a lot of de democratic countries out there that are not high income countries. Many of them, as we saw, do want to become green. Many of them could become greener if they were more democratic. So there should be more cooperation between democratic countries, whether they're rich or poor, but certainly the rich countries have to take the impetus to, through technology, research and development and development assistance in helping democratic countries that are perhaps less, less rich to become green. And there are a number of initiatives that the group of seven, the group of seven economies are uh, Canada, United States, 
um, uh, the United Kingdom, Italy, Japan, Germany, and France, plus the European Union. That's number eight, but it's still called the G7. Um, they have a number of nations. They're, they're, they're high income countries, but they're also high, have a long history of democratic experience. As the group of seven, they they started some initiatives that could be the basis of this cooperation. One is the Joint Just Energy Transition Partnership, uh, which is financing to reduce fossil fuel dependence and reliance on coal for clean energy. And, and those partnerships have already exist for South Africa, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Senegal. Interestingly enough, these countries are reasonably or actually quite democratic uh, on, on most measures, uh, at least for now. Um, and then there's this Partnership for Global Initiative of Investment, and that is really an infrastructure investment for, targeted at developing countries. That could be targeted more at green investments, particularly at things like more sustainable urban development, decarboning industries, and electric vehicle charging networks. And then finally, um, in a couple of papers I published last year, one in Nature and one in uh, in uh, a, more, a more technical, longer piece, but still a policy piece in Oxford uh, Review, uh, sorry, at Oxford, yeah, Review of Economic and Policy, I argued about what a comprehensive strategy could look like if the G7 wanted to do this. If they wanted to, to, to reach out and involve more democratic countries outside the G7 into a group that focuses both on green and climate objectives. And I outlined it, I'm not gonna go through this, you're welcome to look at those papers where I explain it a bit more, but it involves first agreeing to tackle, adopt policies inside their countries that, to make them all greener and to cooperate on that. Then it's to expand the network to other countries and to um, exclude those that don't. And then finally, very importantly, the assistance I talked about for developing countries. Um, so my final remarks is this, greenness and democracy seem to go hand in hand, but that relationship doesn't appear to be direct. It appears to be conditioned on income, as I tried to show. And, um, <clears throat> and basically wealthier democratic countries should start to rethink their global strategy. It's not working to have huge global negotiations to whether it's climate, biodiversity, whatever, it's not working. We're not getting the cooperation and we're not getting the agreement to work together to do these things. We're getting targets and pledges, but many countries are quite simply welshing on those pledges. But I do think there's evidence that high income democratic countries could work with other countries, uh, particularly middle income countries, to, to try and develop a more greener um, uh, cooperation and, and, and assistance and, and mechanisms. Uh, so global negotiation agreements are probably going to be less, less fruitful. Wealthier democratic countries should start thinking about mutual cooperation and assisting more democratic emerging economies that also want to go green. And then finally, as I said at the beginning, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't uh, for Daniel Wall. Um, her loss is a personal tragedy to me, but also to, I think, CSU. And it's just... Uh, one of the last things she said to me by email was, oh, I can't wait to come to your session. So she's here in spirit. So I dedicate this to her. Thank you, guys. Um, so um, questions, comments, thoughts? Great. What were the um, features of democracy is that it doesn't sort of cross international boundaries too much. I mean, we vote in our own uh, in our local situation, our own country, but very little democratic influence, even in other democratic right. countries. Those are very much different relationships, which are yep. subject to completely different mechanisms and treaties. And other. Um, if you, uh, it seems like you could do a version of your analysis inside the country. Mm -hmm. Like it's take the United States, you have 50 different states yeah. with more or less similar democratic experiences, but very different economic ones and income ones. Or you could even go down to the county level and get then you have thousands of data points. Yeah. Would you find the same kind of correlation between uh, the high income counties and 
uh, investments in green policies and uh, you know here in Fort Collins they're, they're pretty invested in yeah. being green and it's a pretty affluent uh, community. Uh, if you go to Fort Morgan, I don't know if you find the same level of commitment to the greenness, and you also don't have the same level of affluence. Really. So is there is there an experiment to be made in, inside uh, inside the country to, where you would likely have a more constant uh, democratic variable? You take maybe. that, maybe, <laughs> but but a rather more uh, income distribution. I think you're pretty much answering possibly your question, which is that uh, um, if there isn't a lot of democratic variation, well, first of all, we have to assume that there's some kind of measure of democracy over the last 50 years for each county in the in, in the uh, in the U.S. and I would suggest that there, if, if there was, I, I'm not aware of it, I mean, there may be, uh, um, but I would suggest that you're right, that it wouldn't vary much. So from county to county, or, or, or even possibly from state to state, I don't know. The difference would be possibly with the uh, early, well, you know, by 95, for example, well, 50 years ago, Certainly, you could see it if you looked at civil rights and the registration of votes that say minorities, you could probably do that. So you might get some, certainly between Southern and, uh, uh, and other, other parts of the U.S. Uh, because of that factor. But uh, an income per capita would vary a lot. So one could do it, I think. Um, I'd have to rethink of it. I've done most of my work on the international set. I mean, the, the G7 work I was commissioned by the G7 to do for their last summit. But um, uh, so um, uh, I've generally focused on uh, levels at the international and the country level. But yes, what could do it if you could get enough uh, data at the county level, let's say, possibly just at the state level, that would show some difference in democracy through some variable. Maybe it would be voter registration as a share of total registration. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not an expert on in, in, intra United States analysis, but it, it could be done. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Anybody else? Questions? Thoughts? Okay. I would, yes, please. I, I just have kind of a, a thought that I, I don't know necessarily how. It could kind of tie into to your research, but I, um, from what I've kind of heard and ex learned about is multinational corporations have big influences on both per capita income and democracies. And, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of look into how that plays into this data as well, as far as like involvement, because I, I know that a lot of more so big corporations especially if, as far as emitting carbon emissions have a really big impact. And so I feel like you see a lot here in the U.S. of lobbying for um, policies that, that benefit their profit rather than, you know, improving the environment. So I wonder how that would kind of play into you know, your research for a second. Well, I mean, in some ways it's, it, it's somewhat covered uh, because uh, essentially by using different measures of democracy, you can see maybe in countries where uh, you have got uh, uh, an influence by large players like mm -hmm. corporations, you're gonna see some, one of these variables is gonna be affected, mm -hmm. most likely the outcome variable. But it could also be the variable, let's say, on more stringent climate action and policies too. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly we see that there's pushback but again, the purpose of this analysis is to look at the longer term trends and the longer term impacts. And that's exactly why you don't want to look at short term current democracy and impacts. But uh, again, another possible variable, I could get a variable that would reflect political lobbying. It'd be, be very interesting to put that in. Now, here's the problem with lobbying is one country's lobbying is another country's corruption and vice versa. So essentially what we call political lobbying, uh, many other countries would call corruption and other countries would, would call corruption what we call political lobbying and vice versa. And so, so one has to be careful about the indicators everybody agrees 
or com can be compared across countries. And the beauty of these data sets is that, you know, green export shift, you know what that is. Carbon dioxide per person, you know what that is. You can measure these things. How do you measure corporate lobbying over 50 years and consistent across countries? That's hard, but it'd be fun to do. Again, I'm not, I, that's not my area. There are a lot of people studying the impact of lobbying in this way. Uh, and that's a whole nother conversation. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Anybody else? Any other comment? I guess we're done. It's reached two o'clock. Well, second thought. Yeah, good, good, good. Leadership. Say that. Leadership. Leadership. Economy and ecology. And who is splicing those together? Absolutely. Good to be one. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.